Well, we're looking at a series, Revival at Christmas. And last time we looked at the prophecy of revival. It went all the way back to the very first prophecy in the Word of God, the Genesis chapter 3. And that first prophecy was not only the first prophecy in the Bible, it was the first prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3. You cannot take Jesus out of the Bible. Amen. And you can't take the Bible out of Jesus because He is the Bible. He's not only the living Word, the the written Word, but He is also the living Word. And so we thank God for that. Well, today we're going to be looking at a picture of revival. Not a prophecy, but a picture of revival. And so uh, uh, let's read the Scripture here together, and then we'll pray, and then we'll talk a little bit about and take a look in the Scripture today of a picture of revival. Draw your attention to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. It's there in your study notes as well, but in your Bibles. Luke, chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse number 26. And the Bible says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women, not above women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, a term that God uses over 365 times in the Bible, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jacob's another term for Israel. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That was prophesied, has not yet been fulfilled. Okay? Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? In other words, I haven't had a relationship with a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for today. We praise you. Once again, we thank you for all your glory, for all your majesty. Father, we thank you for all the splendor that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you we can focus upon Christ at this season of time of Christmas. The spirit of Christmas in our hearts, our families, our home, our church. Not just this month of December, but all year long. And so Lord, we thank you and we praise you for it. Now, fathers, we come before you this morning uh, to study your word and to uh, proclaim your truth of your gospel. Father, we ask for that special anointing and power from the Holy Spirit that would be granted to your servant. Lord, we receive it by faith and we thank you for it. Lord, we thank you that you're going to bring to remembrance the thing Jesus has said to us. Thank you the Holy Spirit will be our teacher and our guide this morning as he guides us into all truth. Father, we thank you he gives us understanding, illumination, and then he gives us wisdom to apply that understanding which we gain and get today. Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts today. May your Holy Spirit speak as though he has never spoken before to this group today. Father, to him that hath an ear, let him hear today what the Spirit says to the church and to their hearts. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. Help us not to be hearers only, but to be doers of your word. And God will thank you for it. Father, we ask you would save souls today for Jesus' sake. 
And thank you for this opportunity to share the gospel literally around the world. And we thank you for it and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and praise the Lord. Well, a picture of revival. Interesting to learn to know about what revival is all about. It's about an awakening of God in your heart. It's about, an, uh, it's about you drawing closer to Christ and God having His will and way in your life personally. Something neat about revival, no man can bring it. A preacher can't bring it. An evangelist can't bring a revival. Revival has to come from God. It's God's responsibility to bring revival And our responsibility is obedience. And so we thank God for it. You know, people think the revival, we have to have all the music and the loud instruments and and the the pack the churches and and have all kinds of contests and and crusades and and rent auditoriums and stadiums and, and that's going to bring revival. Not necessarily. Some think we have to have lots of money. Mega church to have revival. Revival doesn't come that way. You see, revival can come to the individual and an individual's heart and how it is towards the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need all of that to have revival today. All we need is a yield and surrendered life to Christ to have revival. The right heart motive and attitude about all of this and that person can have revival. Oh, it's interesting Many times God doesn't even choose all of those things to bring about revival. Not that any of those things are wrong. My wife was saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Massive crusade. But you see, that's not necessary and needed. It's interesting that God most of the time chooses just individual people. He chooses obscure little villages of less than 400 people there's not very much good comes out of Nazareth to bring about revival in the life and the heart of a person of a little Jewish handmaiden teenage girl whose heart was surrendered to the will of God whose heart was yielded to the Lord to his voice and we know that because she said Lord be it unto me according to thy word. So we're going to take a look at this little Jewish handmaiden girl named Mary that revival came to just one person, one heart. If you recall back in history in the late 1800s, there was a teenage girl that lived in Wales. In 1904 to 1905, had been praying desperately for revival to come. And her Sunday school teacher got a hold of it and together they began praying that God would send revival to Wales. And from 1904 to 1905, God answered that prayer. And 150,000 came to Christ. One out of every 13 person in the country of Wales was saved and born again. Miners would come home in the evening. And they would gather together and have prayer meetings that would go on all night. And joining with this, have their breakfast in the morning and go right back to the mines to work. And revival came because of one teenage girl whose heart was turned to the Lord. We can have revival at Christmas church. We don't have to have all of this. This is nice and I love it. But we have to have a heart that's turned to Christ. In total surrender. In total yieldness. And we can have, truly have, revival. We're going to go take a look at Mary See some wonderful, interesting things. First of all, I want you to notice in verse 26 with me, I want you to see this heavenly appearance. A heavenly appearance. And by the way, this heavenly appearance was sent by God. It was a heavenly angel, by the way. You know that? And his name was Gabriel. It's interesting in the scripture, we don't usually have a lot of names of angels. Angels are not always mentioned by name in the scripture. But for some reason, Gabriel's is number one. He's mentioned more than any other angel in the scripture. Michael's name is mentioned, and really there's not much more than that. There's a few others. 
but not that often. But Gabriel is the messenger of God. And so Mary is about to receive, oh my goodness, a heavenly appearance. I don't know about you, but I've never seen one up close like this. I've never had one talk to me like this. So I can imagine it was quite a, 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 an experience, quite an event. Matter of fact, Gabriel appeared six months earlier to Zacharias to announce the birth of John the Baptist. Matter of fact, Gabriel appeared again to the prophet Daniel and told Daniel about the coming of the Messiah. So we find a great, wonderful, heavenly appearance of this angel. And the Bible says in Daniel, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I have seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly. Oh, these guys move. Touched me uh, about at the time of the evening obligation. That's the, the, the offering, at the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And Daniel prophesied from the Gabriel, uh, the message he got from uh, Gabriel, 550 years before Christ was born. A heavenly appearance. And that was sent by God. You see, church, revival is only going to come by God. Revival is only going to come when God sends it. He's going to send it to a willing heart, to a willing church, if we want to make it collectively. But notice who this revival was sent to. It was sent by God, but it was sent to Mary. Oh, a young teenage a uh, Jewish handmaiden girl. And I want you to notice uh, something about Mary as we take a look at her a little bit here. Uh, that God, it was a very specific message to a very specific person. Okay? So let's talk about Mary. First of all, I want you to know she was a pure woman. See, church, if we want revival, we got to have a pure heart. we got to have a pure mind, a pure motive. You see, a pure attitude. If we want God to send revival to our hearts personally. See, revival's got to start in our heart. You see, and then it'll spread. But you see, it's where is our heart today? Where's our thinking? Where's our mind? Where's our attitude? Do we really want it? Do we really seek it? Do we feel even it's necessary and we need it? Yes. I answer yes to all of that. It is. Mary was a pure woman. Now let's take a look at this first of all. Notice here. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, she was engaged. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The key phrase there, before they came together. She was a spouse. She was engaged. The betrothal was taking place. But the consummation of the marriage had not yet taken place. You understand that? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that in 714, 750 years before it came to pass and was fulfilled. Now let me say something here about this pure woman. She was a pure woman morally, because the Bible says she was a virgin. Now I want to tell you something. The scripture, my Bible, the King James Bible, has taken great care has taken great care to preserve the doctrine of the Virgin Mary. That is a doctrine. It's not a young woman. See, the King James Bible has taken great care throughout the Scripture to preserve the doctrine of the Virgin Mary. That is a doctrine, by the way. It was not a young woman. Yes, she was a young teenage girl. But you see, we don't take that out because you take away then, you take away that doctrine of, of her being a pure uh, woman not knowing a man because any young girl could have a baby. Any young girl could not have been a virgin and had a relationship with a teen, an, another man. So let's not take out the doctrine of virginity in the Scripture. It's important. If God puts it in there, it's for a reason. And she was a virgin she was a pure woman. But I want you to know, so that's important, church. Important. Okay, we need to understand that. She was a prepared woman. Not only was she a pure woman, but she was a prepared woman. Look in verse 27 with me. The Bible says that she was from the house of David. Where did the scripture say that Jesus would come from? 
He would come from the lineage of David. She was of the house of David, so she was a prepared woman for this time. There in verse 27, as you read it, to a virgin espoused uh, to a man named Joseph, uh, who was of the house of David, and then notice the virgin's name. Twice that word's found in just that verse alone. Do not take that out. That's important. Because if you take that out of Scripture and put in a young woman, then you have taken out the the, the purity of Christ being born uh, of the Holy Ghost. You take away His deity. He is God incarnate in the flesh. He was not born of man. He was born of the Holy Ghost and of the Holy Spirit. So she was of the house of David. It's all things that God would look down and find this little Jewish handmaiden uh, with a prepared heart, with a willing heart, with a pure life, that he could send a revival to her and her heart because Mary's going to have a revival. We'll get to it in just a minute. Hang in here with me. Not only was she a prepared woman, but she was a preferred woman. Look at verse 28 with me. In verse 28 it says, And the angel came unto her and said, Hail! Thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, not above, but among women. We do not place Mary above the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not worship Mary. We do not pray to Mary. God just said, you're highly favored. Why not? She was a pure virgin. She had a tender heart. She had a pure heart. She had a pure motive. She had a pure attitude. Why not chose her? You see. Oh, and the fact that she was preferred, she was highly favored. Now, that's an interesting term there. Highly favored, if you want to know what that means, it means greatly graced. Greatly graced. Are you with me? Say amen. Okay. In other words, she was a woman of grace. She was blessed. She was a woman of purity. She was a woman of love. She was a woman of compassion. She was a woman of a right heart attitude and right mind and so forth. So she was highly favored. But she was among the women that God chose, not above the women. She was just blessed and fortunate that God would choose her to bear his son. Why not? Good choice. Amen? Oh, I think so. Highly favored. So we find a little bit she had this heavenly appearance. Now, folks, get ready. We're about to have one, too. The trumpet's about to sound. And the church is about to be removed. And it's going to be removed by a heavenly appearance. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, because of that fact and truth, comfort one another with these words. We're about to have a heavenly appearance, and it's not going to be Gabriel. It's not going to be Michael. It's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. You see, the King of kings will appear in the clouds of glory, and the church is going home. And it might happen sooner than you think. Every sign points to it now. Everything that's happening points to the rapture of the church. Or literally, it's pointing to the second coming. All prophecy, uh, we need no other prophecy to be fulfilled for the rapture of the church. Okay, that's all been done and taken care of. The imminent return of Jesus could take place right now. And everything is sitting right on the edge. I mean, right on the edge of all Bible prophecy to be fulfilled for the return of the second coming of Christ. We're right there. But before that, we've got to have seven years of tribulation. And before that, I have to disappear. And I'm going by way of the rapture. And we're living on the border of the coming of Christ. Of what? We're living on the border of that heavenly appearance. That we look for and long for that glorious appearing, Peter, uh, Paul says, and, and, and of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Wow, what a day that's going to be. That could take place. I wish I had time to go into a lot of stuff that I've been looking at and reading and listening this week uh, that would just blow the socks off your feet. All I'm telling you, get ready. You better be ready. He's coming, and he's coming soon. And you'd better make sure you're saved and born again and know the Lord or you won't make the trip. Amen. I passed out tickets at the party yesterday and told everybody, keep your ticket. This is your ticket. This is your ticket to heaven. Now I'm going to be at the gate collecting tickets. No ticket, no get in. Do you have your ticket? Have you made reservations yet? Do you know the Lord? Are you saved and born again? Is your name written down in the Lamb's book of life? If it is, you got your ticket. Amen. You've made reservations to Hotel Jerusalem. Woo! Hallelujah. That celestial city. And only the saved are going to be there. And we might have a heavenly appearance sooner than you think. Wow, it's going to be glorious. Well, what else do we know about this, dear, dear precious woman? We know also not only do we have this heavenly appearance, but I want you to see a prepared announcement. A prepared announcement. Are you with me? Say amen. We have a prepared announcement. Look at verse 29 with me. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And she cast in her mind, what manner of salutation should this be? I want you to know that Mary had a surprising truth. This announcement was a surprising truth to her. Can you imagine being a teenage young girl and all of a sudden an angel from heaven shows up in your doorstep or out on the field and says, by the way, Mary, God has chosen you to bear his son. Now, can you imagine what she was thinking? Now, I've never had a personal experience with an angel, but I guarantee you, I get it would trouble me. If one appeared, I'd be startled. I'd be scared to death. And you would too. And then for him to start talking to me and start revealing some truth to me. Because you see, if it's an angel from heaven, he's going to bear truth. So she had this wonderful, wonderful announcement from Gabriel. And it was a surprising truth that she was going to have a baby. And certainly that shocked her heart, I guarantee you. Praise God, she didn't go into a cardiac arrest. Amen? Some of us might go into cardiac arrest if an angel visited us and scared the living daylights out of us. And then begin to share a biblical truth with us. Wow, I'll tell you what. Man, Mary's troubled heart. We find that in verse 28. There, she had a troubled heart. She was astonished at this. She was amazed at this, at what she was hearing in her ears. Almost to, the, to a point where this was, we would almost, to us, we would say, this is hard to believe. Or we might say, I can't believe this is happening. Amen. But oh, you see, not only was her heart troubled, but I want you to see Gabriel's comforting testimony. Look at the comforting testimony that Gabriel gives to Mary, and God gives to you and I today the same comforting testimony. Look what Gabriel says in verse 30. You with me? Here we go. And the angel, now this is after she heard this truth, this surprising truth, what was going to happen. Her heart says, whoa, almost too much to take. And the angel knows that because he's from the Lord. In verse 30, the angel said unto her, here we go, fear not. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. Don't be frightened. God's got this in control, Mary. God's got this all taken care of. This is all part of His plan. This is all part of His plan of fulfilling His first prophecy in His Bible about His Son in Genesis chapter 3. Amen? All part of God's plan that this was going to take place. So Mary, fear not. Now church, we know enough today about the Bible, I think, especially from this church. That we don't need to fear what man shall do unto us. We don't need to fear the fake news. We don't need to fear all what's going on in the numbers and the figures, which most of it is false and fake and lies to us, because God's got this thing under control. Amen. He's going to take care of this. He tells us, don't be anxious for nothing. Don't let fear grip your heart. It'll paralyze you. 
Fear will paralyze you. It will immobilize you. It will grip your heart. And it will make you sick. I'm telling you. Let the, the Word of God, which is greater than the angel of God. Come on, are you with me? Assure your heart today that all that's going on, fear not. Fear not, church. You don't need to fear, Mary. Why? You have found favor with God. I want to tell you something, church. If you have the grace of God and you've been saved by the faith and the mercy and the faith of God and the grace of God, you got His favor. And as a believer, you have favor with God today. Oh, praise God, you have favor. That's why Paul would close out his letters to the churches. May the grace of God be upon you. May all of God's favor be upon you, child of God. So you need not to worry. Why worry if we're going to be out of here? Especially if we're going to be out of here by this Christmas. Let me do some more studying and I'll present it to you maybe before Christmas. If not, you can get it up there. Maybe the Lord let me preach up there. All right? Amen? Listen to what 1 John 4, 17, 18 says. Herein is love. All right? Now, what's love? Herein is love is made perfect. What is love? John says God is love. How many believe God's perfect? All right? So herein is, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no Fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. Why? Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Mary, I know your little heart's troubled at this announcement. I would probably be surprised too if I was in your shoes, Mary. I could see the angel thinking about these things. Surely he had to know that was going to be a shock to her system. Amen. Oh, wouldn't that be a shock to your system? Oh, yeah. But Mary, you need not to fear because you have the favor of God on you. And church, if you've got the favor of God on you, there's nothing else you need. You've got all you need if you've got God's favor. And I believe as believers we have God's favor. I believe as His church we have God's favor. So we need not fear what man shall do to us. You see. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Didn't say weapons wouldn't be formed. Oh yes, there will be weapons formed against us, but they will not prosper. Oh, they may look like they've won a few battles recently, in the past few months, out west especially. But the end's not yet. We're on the winning side. The church will be victorious. So need not fear these things. Don't worry about how the election is going to turn out. God's in control. And if we're close to the second coming of Christ, and all the prophecies sitting right on the edge to begin to be fulfilled for His return, which all of that will take place during the tribulation hour, then that means I'm that much closer to the rapture of the church. I'm out of here. That's my comfort to you. Fear not. Behold, He cometh. In the clouds of glory. And we're going home. I'll be home for Christmas. Hang in here, church. You just might be home for Christmas in another two weeks. Now those that are watching and listening, you're probably thinking the preacher has flipped. He's gone off the deep end. Not at all. I believe this book. I trust this book and the prophecy of this book. God has shown us everything in this book. You got to get in it and God will open your eyes to it. And you'll see things you've never seen before. God will reveal things like you've never seen before. And you'll start to shout. When I heard Dr. Jimmy, D, uh, Jimmy DeYoung Friday night, I nearly jumped out of my car as he was sharing the Christmas story based on Scripture prophecy. And he went back to the Maccabees. Remember what I said last week? About the Maccabeans? They took over the revolt? 168 B.C.? 
Oh, you, you, you just, oh, this is good. I, I got to go on. Amen. I'm telling you. Well, not only did she have a surprising truth, but she had a saving truth. She had a saving truth. Verses 31 and 32 with me. Look at this saving truth. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Now notice he said, you shall conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. What was she told earlier? In one of the other gospel accounts, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Do you know the purpose of this whole announcement was Jesus was born to come and to save you and I from our sins. That's the great announcement. It's a saving truth, you see. And what was part of that saving truth? That first of all, Mary, the saving truth is, is that your son will save your soul. The part, other part of that truth is that your son will save the souls of those in the world that are willing to commit to him and trust in him and believe in him. That's the saving truth message that she heard because you're going to call his name Jesus who shall save his people from their sins. You see, Mary would conceive and Jesus would save. Mary would conceive. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Are you with me? Amen. I have declared and have saved. I have showed when there will no stranger God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Isaiah 43, she would conceive a son whose name is Jesus, Jehovah. You know what the word Jehovah means in Jesus? Our Savior. And that's why God said in Isaiah 43, I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Oh, what a saving truth that she would have, that Mary would conceive. Uh, Jesus uh, would save. You see, Mary conceived, Jesus saved. Let's look at Matthew 1, 20 through 21. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Well, Gabriel's got another job to do, doesn't he? Saying, Joseph, thou son of David. Oh, look at the next word. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of, talk to me church, not of man, but of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, Joseph, Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. All right? And in John 1, 11, John says, but he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many, in verse 12, as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see, Mary received a saving truth that Jesus would be the Savior who would save her and you and I from our sins. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you saved us. What an announcement. Wow, what an announcement. So she got this surprising truth. She received a saving truth. But look at the securing truth. Look at the securing truth with me in verse 32. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. That's another word for Israel. For how long, church? Forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Oh, look at the securing truth. First of all, the securing truth, first, first, folks, is found in verse 31. It's in his name. The securing truth of the believer is not in your name. It's not in my name. 
It's not in the church's name. It's not in the denomination's name. Okay, it's not in any one particular faith's name. No, the securing truth of the believer that you and I can be saved, eternally saved from our sins, is in the name, the name that's above every name. It's a name that God has highly exalted and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords to, glor to the glory of God, the Father, you see. It's Jesus and Jesus only. Oh, the security in his name. In Acts 4.12, one of my favorite verses, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You will not be saved by any guru out there. You won't be saved by Joseph Smith. Uh, you won't be saved by Jimmy Jones. You won't be saved by David Koresh. You won't be saved by Allah. You won't be saved by Buddha. You won't be saved by Confucius. You won't be saved by Mohammed. There's only one name that you can be saved, and it is the name of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is his name. Oh, praise God. Boy, you better get a hold of this truth. That's Bible doctrine. That's Bible truth. Amen. Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, ball player. There are 256 names given in the Bible for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I suppose this was because he was infinitely beyond all that any one name could express. So God chose a nice, sweet, easy name, Jesus. Jesus. As Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote, truly there is something about that name. At the name of Jesus, you get saved. At the name of Jesus, you get born again. At the name of Jesus, you get your sins forgiven. At the name of Jesus, you can find healing. At the name of Jesus, you can get demons delivered. At the name of Jesus, sickness has to go. Demons have to flee. You see, at the name of Jesus. Oh, there's something truly about his name. And that's why you should not be embarrassed or ashamed to go in a store, department store, anywhere. And people look at you and say, Have happy holidays. You turn and look back at them and say, Merry Christmas. And may God richly bless you. When people are using his name in vain and cursing his name, that's a time for you to speak out and speak up. And say, no, no, don't blaspheme his name. His name is a precious name. You, well, my friend, listen to me. You can curse his name now. But one day you will bow your knee and you will confess his name as judge and savior of the world to the glory of God. And I'd rather do it now as my savior than later as my judge. Jesus will keep you out of hell. I'll say it again. Jesus will keep you out of hell. Hell is real. People are dying there by the thousands every day, stepping off out into eternity, going to a devil's hell, a lake of fire, for all eternity. We have examples we have in the Scripture. We have a man in Luke that went there. Tell us about it. Hell is real. People are lost without Christ. The Bible says that hell was, was created for the devil and his angels was prepared for them. But the Old Testament says that hell is enlarging its mouth every day. Amen. And Jesus said there's two roads. He said one is wide and broad and many dare travel it. And it's a road that leads to destruction and to an eternal hell. But there's also a straight and narrow road that leads to glory. And few find it. Amen. There's security in his name. But I want you to notice in verse 33, there's security in his rule. Look at verse 33, in his rule. And he shall reign, he shall rule over the house of Jacob, Israel. For how long, church? Forever. Forever. And his kingdom shall be what? There shall be no end. There's security in Jesus' rule. Amen? Second Samuel prophesied it. Look at Second Samuel chapter 7 with me, verses 12 and 13. And when the days be fulfilled... And thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. That's Christ's kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever. 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 For his kingdom. 
Wow. Well, let's wrap it up this morning. We've seen a heavenly appearance to this young virgin. We've seen uh, this beautiful uh, prepared announcement. But now let's look at the revival that came to her heart. A godly expectance. A godly expectance in verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, since I know not a man? How is this going to happen, Gabriel? I'm a virgin. I've never had a relationship with a man. How is this going to happen? Well, guess what, Mary? In verse 35 and 37, you are about to have a supernatural conception. That's how it's going to happen. A supernatural conception. And may I say, folks, there's only been one, and there'll never be another one. Look at this supernatural conception we find here in verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost, not a man, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee, he shall be called the Son of God. A supernatural conception. As Mary's son, he would be human. As the son of the highest, he would be the son of God. That speaks of his humanity and his deity. For unto us a child is born. That's his humanity. Unto us a son is given. That's his divinity. Oh, praise God. Amen. Dr. Tom Malone, great independent Baptist, pastor, everything. When God is going to do something wonderful, he starts with the difficult. When God is going to do something miraculous, he starts with the impossible. Because Luke one thirty seven, if you read this verse, the angel continued telling Mary, Mary, you're going to be conceived of the Holy Ghost. You're going to have a, a child without a man. Amen. How in the world can this be? Because Mary, in verse 37, nothing is impossible with God. Church, nothing is impossible with God. This election, this COVID, this vaccine, all of this, nothing is impossible with God. And another passage of Scripture says, all things are possible to them that believe. We got to believe that good is going to come out of this. We got to believe that righteousness will prevail and holiness. We got to believe that God has got this under control because all things are possible to them that believe. And without faith, we cannot even please God. And Paul said in Romans 14 23, I believe he said, anything that's not done in faith is sin. Oh, praise God. Well, here's the revival, verse 38. We had to get to the bottom of the message to get to revival. But we've been looking at this wonderful little Jewish maiden girl. In verse 38, I want you to see a submissive maiden. A submissive maiden. Here is where we see the perfect picture of revival. Are you with me? Look in verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, Here it is. Be it unto me according to thy word. Church, if we're going to have a personal revival in our heart, we have to be totally yielded, totally submitted, totally surrendered to Christ. We have to be as this little handmaiden girl was. Of all what she experienced in this passage we've looked at, everything that took place, what was her final remarks? She told Gabriel, and she told the Lord, Be it unto me according to thy word. That shows me she was totally yielded, surrendered, and submissive to the cause and to the will of God. That's why Mary got revival. That's why revival came to Mary's heart. And of course, from there, look how it spread and what happened as a result of it. What can God do with a church who would be totally surrendered, totally submitted, totally yielded to the cause of Christ? 
that would be willing to say, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Isn't that what Jesus said in the garden? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Oh, you see, that's what it takes. God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life that's totally yielded to him. Andrew Murray shared that with us. Oh, my friend. Revival is God's responsibility. Obedience is our responsibility. Two questions, and we're finished. In what way do you need to yield to the Lord today? In what way do you need to personally yield to the Lord? Or you'll be willing to say, Lord, be it unto me according to thy will. Believer, child of God, in what way are you willing? Are you ready? Do you need to do and need to yield to the Lord? What way? In your life, your home, your marriage, church, your business, but your individual life. And then the second question is this. To those that are watching, those that are with us, are you ready to meet him face to face someday? He's coming. He's coming in the clouds of glory. You'd better be ready to meet him. Oh, my friend, revival can come to an individual. Revival came to the heart of a young Jewish maiden girl living in an obscure little village town called Nazareth, up on the hill north of Jerusalem, somewhere between 100 and 400 people population. And the testimony was to Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Oh, yeah, when there's a life totally yielded, submitted, surrendered to Christ, there can come some good. And his name was Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your message from your word. Thank you for this beautiful, perfect picture of revival that came to a young teenage Jewish handmaiden named Mary that would bring revival to Nazareth, to Jerusalem, to all of that region and area, and still to this day brings revival to those that are willing to submit their heart, their attitude, their mind, and surrender and yield to the cause of Christ. That's the only way revival is going to come. And so, Lord, we pray that each and individual here will search their own heart today and be willing to stand honestly and openly before you and say, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And then, Father, if there's those here that are not ready to meet you face to face, well, we pray this would be the day they would yield to the Holy Spirit's calling in their life to come to Christ. Father, save souls for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Those of you that are watching by television right now and YouTube, Facebook, Internet, you're with us. We're going to ask you to pray with us. We're going to ask you to receive Christ into your heart, to believe on Him and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. The greatest gift that you could ever receive at this Christmas season is the Lord Jesus Christ. The gift of, the gift of love the gift of eternal life, the gift of everlasting life, the gift of grace, the gift of mercy, the gift of heaven, all of that wrapped up in the person of Jesus. Would you be willing to do that to say, and say, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Well, let me tell you what God's word says, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. That's God's will. Jesus said that he wished, that he desired that every man be saved. Friend, if you've never done that, we invite you to do so today. We're going to pray. 
a prayer to the Lord to invite him into your heart and life to save your soul, to be born again, to become a Christian, a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with us? Let us help you do that right now. Simply pray this, dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess that I've sinned against you, God, in heaven, and I'm sorry. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. He will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart, that's faith, that Jesus died on the cross for me. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe he was buried. And then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so right now by faith, Lord, I do call upon you and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die or this rapture thing that the pastor was talking about. Amen. Either way. Oh, thank you, Lord, for saving me today. And I pray this prayer in simple faith, believing in Jesus' name, the name that's above every name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. 